Good day, everyone! I have a question for you. What comes to mind when you think of the Metal Gear games from before Metal Gear Solid 4? Do you think of the story? A massive political thriller with plot twists, heartache, and an important message about governments and identity. Or perhaps you think of the Metal Gear games for their gameplay. Back in the days before the ubiquitous shooter control scheme and weapons that could, for the most part, be carried over from one play session to the next, making you more of a walking arsenal than a stealthy agent. Back before tactical espionage operations, having an entire army at your back and being able to call in weapons, ammo, or a gunship at will. Back when weapons and equipment had to be procured on site and those weapons were tricky to use and aim. Back when the games would- No, come back. It's interesting if you think about it. Metal Gear was initially created as a stealth game. As fun as it is to build up a base, develop new equipment, start from the beginning of your save with a handheld railgun, or just run through an enemy outpost, clotheslining, and reflex mode tranking would-be friends. That has evolved a bit from Metal Gear's original intention. And that feeling of fighting against insurmountable odds to achieve your goal now seems much more surmountable. One of the key tenets of a stealth game is that you, the player, are massively outmanned and outgunned. And gameplay-wise, that's not really the feeling the newer Metal Gear games give me. That's not to say I dislike the new Metal Gear games. I've undoubtedly put more hours in them than the classics. And that's going to upset some people, I just know it. I absolutely love all of the Metal Gear games. Yes, even the Acid series. And I do believe they're still good stealth games. All I'm saying is, something was... replaced with the advent of Metal Gear Solid 4. So, why do I bring all this up? I have been on YouTube for 10 years now. It's been roughly 10 years since I was first introduced to and hooked on the Metal Gear series. And it's been 10 years since Metal Gear Solid 4 first came out. Recently, I've been playing more of one of the first Metal Gear games I ever owned, Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops Plus. This was the final game released before Metal Gear Solid 4, and it was even the first time Old Snake was a playable character. Surprise, surprise! And if that didn't clue you in, spoilers will abound for what characters are playable in this game. This... over 10 year old game. Eh. So I'm here to argue that this rightfully underappreciated game is a wonderful send-off to the gameplay formula from the original three Metal Gear Solids. And of course, this is just an opinion. Most of the videos I've seen on Ops Plus have just lumped it in with the regular Ops game, saying something like, oh, it's Ops, but without the story and multiplayer focused. Now, the title of this, Unsung Swan Song, which is really a tongue twister now that I think about it, is perhaps the wrong way of describing the game. After all, it did come out, meaning it was sung, but no one really bothered to listen to it. But let me back up. For those who don't know, Ops Plus is the fourth Metal Gear game released on the PSP, the first two being from the Metal Gear Acid series, and the third, of course, being Portable Ops. The original Ops was a follow-up to Metal Gear Solid 3, following Big Boss six years after the events of Snake Eater. Its main draw was a new story with Big Boss, where he recruited enemy soldiers to his side to take out the rogue Fox unit, creating Foxhound in the process, and clear both his and Major Zero's name, the two being blamed for Fox's revolt. It plays like MGS3 subsistence, but with your inventory space being limited to only four slots for weapons, items, and spare ammo combined. To make up for the lack of inventory space, you can now recruit any enemy you come across, including bosses if certain conditions are met, who can then be added to your squad. Those squad members each have four inventory slots themselves, except for bosses who get three slots, with their fourth being permanently taken up by a unique weapon. During gameplay, assuming you aren't alerted, you can switch between any of the other three characters in your squad. If the character you're playing as happens to be a regular soldier, they can blend in with similar soldiers, provided all you do is run around. 
Yeah, even walking slowly will get you caught by these guys. Guess they really don't like you to dilly-dally. All the characters have different stats for stamina, health, their sense, the different types of weapons, and CQC. Pretty definitively the most important, as it determines which CQC techniques you can do. With each higher rank, still being able to do the abilities from the lower ranks. C rank can only do punches and kicks. B rank can grab enemies from behind and push them down in a couple ways. As well as choking out or interrogating grabbed enemies. A rank can grab enemies from the front and slam them, doing stamina damage. And S rank can grab enemies from the front and turn them to the side. There are also stats for technical and medical skills, which are only effective in their respective units. Yeah, this is where those units from Peace Walker and Phantom Pain got their start. Those characters then also have careers, which grant a bonus in some aspect, such as being able to show the locations of enemies on your map if they're in the spy unit, increasing your health recovery when you let time pass between missions if they're in the medical unit, or numerous abilities for the sneaking unit, such as Delivery Man being able to send items from their inventory on a one-way trip back to the truck, or Rescuer being able to drag unconscious enemies faster. Which brings me to the main drawback of the game. Dragging enemies is a drag. No, wait, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> Please come back. But seriously, dragging enemies in the original ops from where you knocked the person out back to the truck for recruitment takes forever. Even the drag speed of the aforementioned rescuers isn't a comfortable speed. Not to mention the annoying pick up and drop speed of whoever you're trying to drag. That said, you can drag enemies to a box one of your squad mates is hiding in, and then give a call to a special codec number that will have your ally recruit any unconscious nearby soldiers. But their box is then moved back to the truck at the start of the map. And worst of all, this ability requires, I believe, a certain number of enemies recruited in the first place in order to unlock it. I can't find any specific information on this, but going off of the anecdotal evidence I've lived through, it's not great. But what does any of this have to do with Ops Plus? And in the beginning, weren't you talking in favor of solo infiltration, not having an army at your back? <laughs> While you do essentially have an army behind you in the Ops series, you also don't at the same time. In Ops, you can recruit a total of 100 characters. In Ops Plus, that was upped to 200. Many of whom, in both games, have no way of supporting you in the field. That's much less than the 350 in Peace Walker, or the 700 to 3,500 in Phantom Pain. Wow, in Phantom Pain you can recruit more people than live in my hometown. Those recruits are also used differently in the Ops subseries. The player only having three units, Spy, Medical, and Technical, with there being a slight difference between Ops and Ops Plus and how those units work. Ops Plus is the integral, substance, subsistence version of Ops. However, it lacks the story, but has numerous little gameplay tweaks, such as upping everyone's drag speed, making it somewhat more tolerable to recruit enemy guards when you're not playing as a rescuer, as you can see here. Now, minus the story is the biggest point here, but probably not for the reason you think. The game does still have a single player mode called Infinity Mission, and this mode is the whole reason I'm making this video. Infinity Mission is the gameplay style of classic Metal Gear, Metal Gear from before MGS4, in its purest form. In those early games, your objective is to sneak through enemy territory while procuring all of your weapons and equipment on site. That's the core principle of Infinity Mission. At the time of making this video, you can still find people on forums asking how to bring weapons into Infinity Mission with you. And no disrespect to those who are asking it, but you can't. That's the point of it. Though you can influence what items you find in Infinity Mission. The higher your tech and medical unit, the different weapons and items they can produce. The spy unit, in addition to their other functions, delivers them onto the maps making the player have to find them during the missions. You can't control what items there are or where they're found, making you have to search the maps and enemies to find your gear. You can't control what maps you go on either, 
the selection being somewhat akin to the procedurally generated levels in Binding of Isaac or Spelunky. Rather than totally random levels that are different every time you play them, you instead sneak through the different maps from Ops, never repeating the same map on a run, trying to find the exit point, which is in one of several possible locations each time you run the map. Enemy placement and type, I'll get to that later, are somewhat randomized as well. On lower difficulties, you're more likely to be put on smaller maps with, I believe, less variety of enemies. Meaning, if you have the right type of recruit to play as, you don't have to do much sneaking and can just run to the exit, blended in with all of the surrounding enemies. On higher difficulties though, there will sometimes be three different types of enemies on a map, and you have to play larger, more difficult maps. And then every so often a special mission is thrown into the mix. What that special mission is varies based on the difficulty you're playing at. These can range from getting to the exit while an alert is in effect the whole time, to getting to the exit without triggering an alert. The latter special mission is only on extreme difficulty, and it can end a run on extreme difficulty if you're on a bigger map you're not familiar with. Or if you're just bad, like me. But it makes for some of the tensest I've been in a long time while playing Metal Gear. Then after special missions, you're at a withdrawal point. This is where you can swap around items between squad members and swap out squad members for any other character you've recruited during the current run. If you have a character low on health or stamina and you don't want to risk keeping them in your squad, swap them out for someone with full health and stamina. The other character will be healed up by the time you get to the next withdrawal point. Or maybe you really like your team and don't want to risk losing them to the perils of extreme mode. So you withdraw uh -huh, back to the starting menu. You lose any soldiers or items you recruited, as well as not getting your bonus XP or code name at the end. But then, maybe you don't withdraw. You keep going. The final mission is a neutralize all enemies against the Tengu soldiers. Yeah, all those soldiers from Arsenal Gear in MGS2. Swords and all, they're the only normal soldiers who have permanent weapons. But the returning enemies don't end there. You have the Gerlukovich soldiers from the Tanker Chapter and the Shell 1 Corps of MGS2, the Riot Guards from MGS2's Plant Chapter, now dubbed the High Tech Soldiers, and the Seals from MGS2. Do you like those enemy soldiers from Metal Gear Solid 3? The Ocelots, the Gru, the KGB? Get lucky with an access point scout and maybe you'll find some! But there are some twists too. Get really lucky and you'll find some female Ocelot soldiers. Even the Genome Troopers from MGS1 can be found in Extreme Mode, and it doesn't end there. You can find the rare Heart of J item, which will awaken the true power of the Genome Soldiers, making them into... But it's not over yet. I mentioned this being the first game you can play as Old Snake. You unlock him after beating Normal Mode in Infinity Mission. Who do you get for beating hard? MGS2 Raiden complete with the faster movement, for those who can't get him in MGSV, and even his HF blade! Even if it doesn't have the non-lethal side. And sadly, he can't cartwheel. So, who do you get for extreme- Campbell. Roy Campbell. So, is that it? Well, have you ever wanted to play as Johnny? No? What about his grandfather from MGS3? He's in here. Somewhere as a random prisoner. I've yet to find him on this save file. But the game is more than just fan service. Here's something I didn't even notice about the game until I was editing a live stream some time ago. This game made me choose between holding someone up, knocking them out, or tranking them. The choice could have also included killing, but I was going for a foxhound run, so that was a no-go. In most Metal Gear games, I know where I'm going and about how long I'll be on a given map. So how I neutralize a guard is largely superfluous. At a glance, those three ways to neutralize a guard are basically the same. But when you're on a Foxhound run with the randomly placed exit points of Infinity Mission, the differences are glaring. But then this still applies to non-Foxhound runs when you're just playing the game as intended, sneaking around trying not to get seen while also trying not to kill people. At this one particular moment in the run, I was on the large power plant map. It has both annoyingly tight corridors with hard to check around corners, and wide open areas where you can easily be spotted. And thanks to being on a Foxhound run, I was on a time limit to find the exit point. I ended up with two guards on the roof, 
and was trying to decide the best way to keep them there. They were already unconscious, so whenever they woke up, they'd know an intruder was afoot, something that wouldn't be if I tranked them without being seen. On extreme, being knocked out doesn't last as long as you need it to. I had a trank gun, I could have knocked them out, but the crutch that is the trank gun in Metal Gear is a rare find in Ops Plus. And its bullets are a precious resource that you must figure out how to manage if you're graced with them. So my options were to leave them there to wake up and call in an intruder, or wake them up and hold them up. No other guards were going to come on the roof, so it's an easy solution, right? Wrong. As with most Metal Gears, guards will stay held up until an alert is triggered or another guard finds them. The latter then causing caution to be triggered, which is the whole thing I'm trying to avoid. But in Ops Plus, held up guards also make noise on your surround indicator. The noise doesn't attract other guards, so what's the problem? You see, the exit point also makes noise on the surround indicator to help lead you to it. Holding up an enemy is more permanent than knocking them out, but it potentially makes finding the exit more difficult. Do you see how well the ways you can neutralize guards fit into the game thanks to the Infinity Mission? Due to how long the enemies stay unconscious in Extreme and the difficulties use of larger maps? Maybe this brilliant choice of resource management versus a strict time limit versus too much noise on your surround indicator is just exclusive to the highest difficulty or a foxhound run. But traces of it can still be experienced throughout all of Infinity Mission, as the biggest difference would just be the longer unconscious timer. Sure, you could kill the guards, but the lethal guns are rarely suppressed in Ops Plus. Not to mention being incentivized not to kill your potential recruits or your shot at a better ranking and higher experience points. Infinity Mission's randomized, explorative, stealth-based gameplay encourages the player to really think about how they're going to neutralize an enemy. Randomized, explorative, stealth. Sounds like a concept that would have fit nicely into Phantom Pain's open world. What I'm saying is, the Infinity Mission is a lovely nod to the first three MGS games, while adding gameplay decisions that weren't really a factor before. It boils down Metal Gear to its core principle of sneaking, and gives random elements to keep the game fresh on subsequent playthroughs. And it's not that long of a mission either. On Extreme, it's never taken me two hours to finish, even being able to finish it in under an hour sometimes. But while I do love Infinity Mission, I only like Ops Plus. Why? Ops Plus, which came out in 2007, is a multiplayer-focused expansion of the original Ops. You see the issue immediately. The servers were shut down on March 30th, 2012, taking most of the features with it. You can still scan access points for soldiers, but without the multiplayer or cyber survival mode, there's not much to do with all the characters you train up and all the weapons you stockpile. The multiplayer mode was basically the gameplay from single player, but with modes like deathmatch, capture the thing, and probably a stealth mode. You can tell how much I dug to find information. There was also a chat room game mode, which was a casual mode just to chat or do whatever. I remember back around 2009, the few matches you could find were mainly chat rooms, and many forums around the internet called the game a glorified dating sim, just with more shooting. But perhaps the most unique feature of the multiplayer was real combat. I believe this feature could be tacked onto any other game type. It made use of the recruitment feature and tying the mode into single player by making character death in matches permanent, as well as possibly losing all items they were holding. Again, I haven't done research. Additionally, I believe, if the host allowed it, you could bring healing items into a match. To this day, there's still a counter on each character's information page that tells how long they've been in real combat, but not much can be done with it now. If there were any benefits to this counter or real combat, I'm not quite sure. It's never something 8th grade me took part in without a set of expendable characters I had just recruited for the purposes of real combat. And as I also mentioned, there was a mode called Cyber Survival. This is essentially the predecessor to Outer Ops from Peace Walker and Deployment from Phantom Pain, but it was online and against other players. You would set up a squad of four characters and put in their inventory whatever you thought they would need. You then deploy them and they'd fight squads that other players had deployed. Again, with permanent death and possibly permanent item loss. I can't really speak from experience, but in theory, these two game modes were serviceable for the end game. 
Those who played Infinity Mission to completion multiple times and have many soldiers, weapons, items, and stat increasing books that they'll never use could be put into characters for these game modes. Losing them due to other players then gives you a reason to play Infinity Mission more to train and stock back up in, potentially, a compelling cycle between single player and multiplayer. Of course, these reasons might also make these modes unpopular, as all that time and effort could go to waste, especially if you get attached to characters like I do. Regardless, this is no more. I believe it's still possible to play a limited version of the multiplayer mode, assuming you have a PS3 with a wired connection and the free ad hoc party application on it. This should allow you to play the ad hoc or local multiplayer mode of Ops Plus with other people from around the world, but even then, I'm pretty sure you can only play with up to three other people, and they're all required to have the game, a PSP, and a PS3 with wired internet. Not the most convenient way of reliving my nostalgia. But even with all of that, Infinity Mission is a wonderful mode that I consider a lovely send-off to the original Metal Gear trilogy before the formula changed. It has the makings of a compelling gameplay loop for the classic Metal Gear gameplay, but lacks what's necessary to complete that loop. It's very easily arguable that what was there before with Infinity Mission and the real combat multiplayer wasn't a good enough completion to that gameplay loop, but it was something. With multiplayer nearly impossible in 2018, I can't call Ops Plus a good game. It's a decent game with a good game mode. Both this and the original Ops were made playable on the Vita and PSTV, and you can pick them both up for around $10 each. Just know that the game doesn't feel the best to play if you're using an analog stick on a controller. As much as I enjoy both of these over 10 year old games, I wouldn't recommend them unless they were half off, given how limited they both can feel. That said, you do what you want. I have a digital copy and a physical copy of both, the latter being from over 10 years ago, so what do I know? Ops Plus was one of the first Metal Gear games I got to play, and one of the first I owned, so it's always going to have a special place in my heart. I only made this video to commemorate my love of this series, and for my channel's 10 year anniversary on March 24th, 2018. Which is also when I meant to have this video out by. I even, uh, I even skipped a university paper to work on this video. <laughs> Whoops. I mean, I still passed. Don't follow my example. I'd also really hope to have this out before the 10-year anniversary of Metal Gear Solid 4, but... You know, whatever. I can at least have this out before the end of 2018, right? Right? I say recording this on the 24th of December. But for now, thank you all so much for listening to me gush about an absolutely alright game. I feel weird when people remind you to subscribe at the end of videos, as if you don't already know. So, if you want to see more videos like this, don't subscribe, because I'll probably never do one like this again. I mean, just look how long it took me this time. But all that aside, until next time, please remember to be safe, be kind, and help give someone a good day.